Shri told me uh, approximately 10 minutes ago that I was going to be responsible for introducing today's speaker, but fortunately that's uh, not a problem uh, because I know Kathy pretty well. Uh, and she's easy to introduce, uh, she's terrific. Um, she's actually, you know, there's a lot of graduate students in the room and she's what we hope all you graduate students are going to become, uh, a huge success. Um, Kathy is, uh, was one of my doctoral students. She entered the program here in fall of 2002. And uh, Kathy sent out, and Kath Kathy sent out an email to the, our law gr um, group, the law dogs, saying that Kathy Ford was actually a law dog masquerading as an historian. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, Kathy got her degree here in 2005. She wrote a wonderful dissertation, which became this book, which she is going to be talking about, Literary Journalism on Trial, Mason versus New Yorker and the First Amendment. Her dissertation in 2006 won the Nassiker White Dissertation Award. For those of you that don't know, that is the award given annually by the Association for Education and Journalism and Mass Communication for the best dissertation in our field. And field means, you know, everything from history, law, public relations, effects, you know, covers the whole spectrum. So that's, that's really quite an honor. And then Kathy converted her dissertation into this book that she'll talk about today, which was published by the University of Massachusetts Press in 2008. Uh, she already has another book contract with UMass Press. Uh, and this book is going to be um, about the publication reading history of James Baldwin's The F Fire Next Time. Uh, exploring Baldwin's writings on America's race problem, played out how it played out in social change in various public spheres during the long civil rights movement. Kathy is an assistant professor now at the University of Minnesota uh, in very, very cold uh, <laughs> Minneapolis, St. Paul, and uh, teaches their course in literary journalism plus graduate and undergraduate courses in mass communication history. So we are delighted to have one of our own back for the colloquium, Kathy. Um, that went into the book and, and the story it tells. 
um, about journalism history in America and um, the First Amendment, its relationship to the First Amendment and to very important um, spheres of um, practical and intellectual work in this, in this country in terms of um, academia and in terms also of the professional work of journalism. So let me start just by telling you kind of the, the overarching um, story of the book, which is the story I tell here is about two different conceptions of what makes a truthful report of the world. One of these is rooted in what I call for convenience sake, um, the reductive term, traditional journalism. And when I talk about traditional journalism, I'm talking about daily journalism as it developed um, in professional journalism across um, the 20th century in the United States. I'm talking about the ideal of objectivity that it has held as its guiding ideal. I'm talking about its um, centering on the delivery of fact, on the facticity um, element of human language and um, on neutrality and the inverted pyramid report, the very particular kind, all the different um, journalistic standards and norms and conventions that accompany this particular way of telling the truth about the phenomenal world out there. That's one report that I tell the story of this development across the 20th century. Another form of representing the world of truthful report that I tell in this um, history is that of literary journalism, which developed along a very different historical trajectory um, across, again, across the 20th century. It has its practical and intellectual roots in the 19th century. Um, it has obviously a long tradition, even though somewhat suppressed and um, marginalized in American journalism. Um, and it had, as it developed, it developed different standards, norms, and conventions, and even different conceptions of how language can represent truth in a journalistic report. So my book tells these, this story of these two, re two different notions of what constitutes a truthful report for the purposes of American journalistic practice um, and for the public to read about the world that is out there that we live in. Um, how they developed across the 20th century, what was similar between them and what was profoundly different. Um, and one of those differences were these different cultural norms, values, journalistic standards, and in particular this notion of truth. Why that story? Mason v. New Yorker is a libel case. It's actually a libel case that involves the First Amendment. It is a case that the U.S. Supreme Court in this country decided in 1991, and in that case, they articulated a, a new rule of law or a new articulation of the actual malice standard, which is a rule of law that was erected in New York Times v. Sullivan in 64. I'll get to why that's important in a little while. right? But this story, this, this story I tell about the history of these two forms of report, I tell um, because they're important to understanding the significance of this particular libel case. And that then brings me to the story of this libel case. Um, and let me tell you the story then. In 19, well first of all I should tell you that in this case, this case involved a work of literary journalism that was written by a writer, Janet Malcolm, at the New Yorker magazine, which has been an incubator for this particular form of journalism since 1925, when it first, um, when the magazine was first um, published, and ever since. So that it is, a, it is a place that has incubated this particular form where this particular form has flourished and developed across time in this country. Um, the, so the case involved a work of, of literary journalism published at the New Yorker magazine. And um, that's, where, that's where I'll begin. In 1983, the New Yorker magazine published a two-part profile by Janet Malcolm, who was a very, and continues to be a well-known writer at the New Yorker magazine. She's published a lot of books, nonfiction in nature, almost all of them have been compilations of pieces that she's written for the New Yorker magazine. Many of them book linked when they were published in the New Yorker magazine. This is one of them, this article that became the subject of um, the object of contestation in this libel case. And she wrote about um, a guy by the name of Jeffrey Mason. How many of you know something about this case? You know something about who Jeffrey Mason is? Well, Jeffrey Mason began his career as a Sanskrit scholar. He then decided he wanted to be a psychoanalyst. He um, got trained as a psychoanalyst. He um, quickly positioned himself, got to know all these people in the Ford archives, and um, ingratiated himself with the directors of the board of the Ford archives, and becomes, in short order, the director of the Ford archives. He's a really 
gregarious guy, particularly at the time, gregarious, outgoing, um, someone who can, just a talented, talented talker, right? So if you think of Michael Jordan with the basketball, think Jeffrey Mason with words. The guy can talk, right? And loves to talk. I know that because I interviewed him. Um, he still loves to talk, and he's good at it. He's very charming and very good talker, very good storyteller. Well, um, he's director of the Ford Archives, and in short order, he begins publishing and speaking publicly a lot of revisionist work on Freud. Right? He begins challenging traditional understandings of Freud's seduction theory. He begins revising um, the orthodoxy in Freud's scholarship, and he very quickly finds himself at odds with the directors of the board. Um, can't make amends, and they wind up booting him. Right? So he's ousted as the director of the Ford Archives. The New York Times picks up the story. They write about it. And then Janet Malcolm reads the New York Times. She thinks she's written about psychoanalysis in the past. She gets very interested. Her father was a psychoanalyst. She wants to, she decides she wants to um, interview him for one of those classic New Yorker profiles. You all have read those. They, at least back in the day, they went on for book length, right? So this particular one that she asked Mason if she could write about it, he said yes, right? He was delighted he was going to be the subject of this New Yorker profile. She then goes on across the next seven months to interview him repeatedly. This is an element of much long form journalism that's literary in nature, narrative in nature, is um, an immersion process, immersion journalism, right? And of course, because it's literary journalism or narrative journalism, the point here is to tell a story, but not only story, there's also deep analysis and, and other types of modes of um, telling, modes of representation involved in this profile, but it is largely narrative in nature. And so, of course, she is adopting as literary journalists do um, a lot of the techniques of storytellers, right? Which journalists get to do, of course, but it's different from traditional journalism. She interviews him over the course of seven months on the West Coast where he lives, on the East Coast where she lives in New York City. She gets 40 hours of interview tape. She, um, you know, it's a, it's a relationship that's different from the typical journalist subject relationship in traditional journalism, daily journalism, where, you know, you may develop a relationship with a source that you use repeatedly, but typically, uh, at least we hope, <laughs> there aren't these, or tradition, I should say we hope, but there aren't these deep relationships that form. Um, well, there was a relationship that formed here, and that's also context for understanding what happens next. Um, Mason had the idea that Janet Malcolm was going to write about his career as a Freud scholar and his, you know, his revision of scholarship, and in particular, his, um, his ideas about um, the seduction theory and about child abuse. She does do that in the book. She does a lot more in the book. And a lot of this is a, a profile of Jeffrey Mason as a person, right? And he was not happy with the resulting profile um, that comes out with his representation in this profile. Um, he found himself, he believed himself to be represented as this vain, inglorious, disreputable, um, profligate scholar, right? He was, could not be trusted. Um, and a buffoon. He believed he was represented as a fool and a buffoon in, in the profile. So he launches a libel case. He, he files a libel claim against Janet Malcolm in the New Yorker. He says he was defamed, right? And that she printed falsehoods about him um, and defamed him in that way. But, he says, she did it through misquoting him. That was the that was the it, that was the uh, form of language at dispute in the case. She said, "He said I didn't say a lot of these things. She has me saying about me that are damaging. She has me say all these things about myself that I didn't say, and that make me look foolish and like an idiot and irresponsible and not a good scholar. And I didn't say those things. And you know, that's that." She says she did. He did say those things. So when the initial level complaint was filed. I think there were like 13 different quotations that were at issue. By the time it went to um, got, went to trial, there were five, only five remaining. What happened was during the, dis the discovery process, he um, interview tapes, the defense had to give um, the interview tapes over to, um, to the prosecutors. And what he discovered in that process was that he did say a good many of those things about himself because they were there on tape. These five remaining quotations were not on tape. And they, um, Janet Malcolm claimed that she had taken notes um, 
this was a disputed issue of fact in the case, right? He said, she said. Um, let me give you a few of those, just so you get a sense of what we're talking about here in terms of, in the terms of this story. That's just a picture of my book, just in case you haven't seen it yet. <laughs> um, let me read to you. So these are some of the quotations at issue. I want to pay, a, spend a little, just a little moment here on the sex woman fun quotation. Um, so you can get a sense of how it read in the articles. And then, by the way, these articles were then published as a book by Knopf. So not only was Janet Malcolm sued, New Yorker was sued, and Knopf was sued, right? Um, so in this first one, um, Mason is ostensibly talking about Maresfield Gardens, which is the, um, it's the Freud home in London. And this is also where the Freud archives are held, right? So Maresfield Gardens is Freud's family house. Um, and this is what he ostensibly said, what Malcolm has him saying. It was a beautiful house, but it was dark and somber and dead. Nothing ever went on there. I was the only person who ever came. I would have renovated it, opened it up, brought it to life. Maresfield Gardens would have been a center of scholarship, but it would also have been a place of sex, women, fun. It would have been like the change in The Wizard of Oz from black and white into color. And of course, the part here that he had a problem with, he believed it was defamatory, was the sex, women, fun business, right? So let me read to you two, um, two things he actually did say that are on tape. It is an incredible storehouse. I mean the library, for its library alone is priceless in terms of what it contains. All his books with his annotations in them, the Schreber case annotated, that kind of thing. It's fascinating. Pretty innocuous, does that seem a lot like this one? Not particularly, but it is about the Ford house. Um, in this other quotation, he's talking about this London analyst he, he is telling um, Malcolm about, um, he, he liked and wanted to have as a guest at the Ford house. I like him. So, and we got on very well. That was the first time we ever met, and you know, it was buddy-buddy, and we were to stay with each other, and we were going to pass women on to each other, and we were going to have a great time together when I lived in the Freud house. We'd have great parties there, and we were going to really, we were going to live it up. A little bit closer in terms of content. That said, he says he did not say sex, women, and fun, right? And he may have said these other things, but he did not say that. And that was defa defamatory, more defamatory than some of the things he claims he did say. And of course, you can see these other quotations as well. So whether or not these quotations constituted libel, that was the legal issue in the case. Um, the reason it, this becomes important for me um, in the story that I tell here is that in these two different kinds of report, traditions of reporting that develop across the 20th century, Daily traditional journalism has a particular ethic of quotation. And it has, of course, changed over time. It's not been continuous across time. But what it's developed into, certainly by the time of this case, was in, in most realms of traditional journalism, it was understood by most and agreed upon, the consensus was, that the only kind of quotation acceptable would be strict, verbatim, stenographic quotation of a source. This was not the historic practice at a place like the New Yorker and other places that worked in the realm of literary journalism. What had been the practice that had developed over time there was the tinkering with quotations in order to make them more literary in nature, not to misrepresent, according to these literary journalists, not to change the record, not to have people utter or make factual statements that they did not say, but to and that in order to clean up the prose so that it would make, it would read better on the page because the argument was, as Janet Malcolm made it, and I'll read that argument to you in just a moment to give you some sense of what it was, um, that, that speech is different from prose on the page and that in representing in, in literary journalism, one needs more than just these little partial um, quotations. You know, in traditional journalism, it's understood that quotations, you know, the New York Times today, quotations come off, even if there's just the tiniest of change, right? The, the quotation marks comes off, or you get a partial quotation, or you get paraphrased, right? That's the standard. At the New Yorker, across history, that has not been the standard. And let me read to you Janet Malcolm, or a little bit of my book that explains a little bit of what Janet Malcolm's notion was of what was appropriate. Um, and this, of course, was a notion that had she was not alone in. This was an inheritance, right? A cultural inheritance of this tradition. Gary Boswick, by the way, is a First Amendment media lawyer, um, not just 
First Amendment for the media lawyer in this country. And so he defended her at the first trial. I'm talking in the book at this moment, I'm talking about the first trial in the case. I'll get to that in a moment too, give you a history of the case. Um, but he, in this passage, you get a sense of what Janet Malcolm's argument is about the quotation. When Gary Bostwick presented his opening arguments in defense of Janet Malcolm in the first libel trial of Mason v. New Yorker, he made an obvious point, obvious at least to many readers of the New Yorker. People in the New Yorker don't talk the way you and I do, he told the jury. The jurors had read the Mason profiles in preparation for the trial, so they knew what he was talking about. By the time the case went to trial, the quotations at issue had been winnowed down to five, most of which appeared in a long, multi-page monologue Malcolm had Mason deliver over lunch at a cafe. It is classic New Yorker-style seamless speech, articulate, polished, complete sentences, flowing one after the other with perfect cadence and clear logic. It is the kind of speech, of course, that few in real life ever manage to utter, the kind we are imagine ourselves using at our witty, chatty best, but know we never pull off. Verbatim speech is almost always not pretty, at least when it is reproduced at any length. This was Janet Malcolm's perspective. At least, oh, this was Janet Malcolm's perspective, which she explained repeatedly as she was forced to defend her use of compression and translation techniques, first in the press and later at trial. In an essay published in the New York Review of Books, and as the afterword to her book, The Journalist and the Murderer, she argued that transcribed speech should not be the same as the final written version. The ear and the mind filter speech and make sense of it, she asserted and the writer must do the same. And here I quote from her. Fidelity to the subject's thought and to his characteristic way of expressing himself is the sine qua non of journalistic, express, of journalistic quotation, one under which all stylistic considerations are subsumed. Fortunately for reader and subject alike, the relatively minor task of translating tape recorder ease into English and the major responsibility of trustworthy quotation are in no way inimical. In fact, as I have proposed, and over and over again have discovered for myself, they are fundamentally and decisively complementary. Malcolm's argument that quotation, at least in literary or narrative recordage, should be more than stenographic is compelling, at least to many who see value in this kind of nonfiction reporting found in the pages of The New Yorker and publications like it. But her argument was ill-received in the press community. In writing about the case for the New York Times during the Supreme Court stage of its travels, Alex Jones contended, by journalistic standards, if Ms. Malcolm did pipe the quotes, she would be guilty of dishonesty and unprofessional behavior. Journalists use quotations, Jones noted, to show the reader that the narrative portion of an article is based on something more than the writer's opinions. And for that reason, a sort of covenant exists between reader and writer that whatever appears between quotation marks is a literal verbatim reflection of what someone said. Jones's implied point that anything less than verbatim quotation comes dangerously close to fabrication characterized press coverage of the case during the 12 years it worked its way through the judicial system. Again and again, Malcolm was represented as an unethical reporter. So for those of you who were alive and kicking it and paying attention <laughs> to press coverage during um, the life of this case, you will probably remember if you read the New York Times, during the life of this case, the New York Times loved to write about Janet Malcolm, and they loved to write about this case. In the first federal trial, for example, which did not come until 1993, a whole decade after the case was filed, in the first federal trial, the New York Times covered a libel trial, y'all. We're not talking about the O.J. Simpson murder trial. They covered it every day on the front page, right, this particular libel trial. Well, yes, it was. <laughs> she murdered journalism? That's what they thought. That was the claim. Well, murdering makes murder. <laughs> this is what, this is, and so she was. She was pilloried in the press all during this coverage. And again, you had the New York Times, you know, the, the um, protector in many ways, particularly in the 1980s and 1990, you know, 1990s, of this traditional journalist, journalism, the, uh, the ideal of objectivity, the um, place of fact um, in representing the world, and then you had Janet Malcolm, Pariah, right? The, the complete antithesis of that. And so um, that was, that gives you a little sense of the issues um, at stake here. Now, so we, if you think a little bit about the traditional report and you think of its theory of truth that it's ascribing to, it's a, it's a course 
correspondence notion of truth when we get to language issues. And this is a really important part of the, art, the historical argument that I make in this book. I'm very interested in the ways in which <coughs> courts go about protecting or not protecting speech and press and ex expression based on the supposed facticity or not of speech, right? And so I'm very, very, I'm very um, interested in, when, in, in the protections of foreign speech based on this notion of language, based on theories of language. Um, so in the traditional notion of journalism, there's a really, in terms of language theory, you've got a, what I would call a correspondence theory of truth. That is, language represents the world out there. There's almost a one-to-one -one correspondence between the ability of language, what we say in language, and the world that exists out there beyond us. Um, in the realm of literary journalism, what you have is much more of a coherence notion of truth. Um, in which facts are not taken to speak themselves, in which language is contested territory, in which um, it is not always clear, in fact, um, that language, and even language that purports to be factual, is indeed representing the world in a fair and truthful way, right? And so literary journalists kind of take a look at, the, at their work at this, you know, they're trying to represent the truth in a kind of coherence notion, right? And so you have these two reports developing um, historically with these different notions of truth. And then the Mason case comes along in 1983. And if you think about what's happened from 1983 to 1991, when the case finally <coughs> makes its way to the US Supreme Court, um, what has happened in American intellectual life and then in American public life is you have the emergence of postmodernism. And what happens when postmodern, the postmodern critique of the ideal of objectivity begins to take hold in the first in the academic disciplines in the 1960s, even in the hard sciences, folks. I mean, this is Thomas Kuhn is, is all, you know, the structure of scientific revolutions. He, of course, is um, questioning these, the positivist notion of knowledge. And he is, of course, questioning the positivist and the objectivist notion of science in particular, right? That knowledge is always stable, that truth is stable. Um, he questions this. And so, and that begins to happen, of course, in literary studies most profoundly. You all, those of you, again, who were uh, paying attention back then to the world, you remember how much post-structuralism and deconstruction really unsettled so many of the disciplines. Um, and it also, over time, by the time we get to the Mason case in the 1980s, and absolutely by the early 90s, when the culture wars erupt in this country over um, politically correct language, and all this anxiety leaks out of the academic and intellectual world into pu the public realm and into public discourse and into the courts in the form of this case and others. You've got all this public anxiety happening about how language is or is not being used appropriately to tell the truth about the phenomenal world. And it, it all gets down to this, you know, this case is where you get these two different um, historical traditions of reporting, they collide, ultimately, finally collide right, in this really incendiary way. And one reason it becomes so incendiary in the 1980s and 1990s is because the intellectual pro um, project of post-modernity and of this critique of objectivity that's happening in history, right, and not so much in the world of journalism, right, other than the new journalists, the literary journalists of the 1960s and 1970s who are challenging, you know, using those notions to challenge the old order. But you even have historians who are challenging this. And historians, I mean, we truck in facts. We, we truck in this notion. And you can't be a radical postmodernist and be either a scholar of journalism or be uh, a historian. You just can't. That said, these notions begin, they unsettle a lot of received conventional wisdom, not only in intellectual life, but then in public life. And so this case becomes not only a way of kind of interrogating and investigating and talking about publicly all of these kinds of issues that everyone's upset about, um, but it, it, it's a manifestation of it all, right? It's a manifestation of these historical tensions that developed over time, not only in journalistic practice, but also in, um, the, in the academy and in this overall um, public discourse that's happening in, in America. Why do I care at all about this beyond telling the story? There are normative issues at stake here. And they have everything to do because this case, Mason v. New Yorker, involves the First Amendment. And the rule of law articulated in this case is one that descends, it's, this case is progeny of the New York Times v. Sullivan in 1964. And this case is one further way of articulating 
not only the actual malice standard erected in this case, which I'll talk about in just a moment, but it's also a way of further um, articulating and interpreting first the, first the meaning of the First Amendment in our public life. And that's what concerns me in this case. Um, I am deeply controlled by um, the way in which the, the legal ruling in this case, even more particularly the way in which the first the meaning of the First Amendment was articulated by the U.S. Supreme Court, the theory undergirding this rule, this articulation of actual malice standard, how it departs from New York Times v. Sullivan. So let me go back really briefly and quickly to New York Times v. Sullivan, this um, very important 1964 First Amendment and libel case. And this, and I won't go into the particulars of the case, most of you have studied it at some point in your career, so know about it, but in New York Times v. Sullivan, the U.S. Supreme Court, for the first time, drew libel law, right, the law that, that governs reputations in this country, into the arena of the First Amendment. And in, in doing so, they erected these very strong constitutional barriers um, to plaintiffs being able to succeed in, particularly public officials, and then over time it became public figures, and over time um, matters dealing with public concern. They erected this very strong constitutional barrier to plaintiffs being able to sue the press successfully for libel. Um, in other words, they were trying to they were trying to protect the press expression, so it couldn't so the law of libel could not be used as a political and social and cultural cudgel to silence the press, which is exactly how libel law was being used as a political and social tool to further the racist um, ideology and state policies in this country. Jim Crow South in Alabama in the 1960s, right? That's my that's my take on the New York Times v. Sullivan. So in this in New York Times v. Sullivan, what the U.S. Supreme Court does in terms of First Amendment theory is it articulates this very strong case for why the press should be protected in this country and why this the actual malice standard is necessary to protect the press. And the First Amendment theory is essentially one that we're all familiar with that we must protect expression, not only of the press, but of every single one of us, right? All, all people in the United States must be protected in order to, we have to have this robust space where public discussion, public discourse can take place. And there has to be space for error, even error that wrongly defames another person. That we have to create this public space um, for robust, critical, caustic, even error-ridden discourse because it is so important to democracy in this country. That is, we cannot have a, demo a democracy that's worth its name, right, unless we have these kinds of protections. Um, and we have to have them in the realm of libel law as well as other areas. So this is the, the theory of the First Amendment in New York Times v. Sullivan. The other thing I want to point out about, about New York Times v. Sullivan is the only, in New York Times v. Sullivan, the court established that the only kind of expression which can be susceptible of um, a truth or falsity test in the libel setting is factual language, language that clearly is a statement of fact. We all know, of course, you can't have a truth or falsity test for a matter of opinion. It doesn't make sense, right? Um, over time, from New York Times v. Sullivan until um, the Mason case, which is 1991 and its progeny, it develops that line of case law um, in the realm of libel and the First Amendment. By the time um, that Mason rolls along, you have had the court increasingly, from 1964 to 1991, hearing libel cases involving the First Amendment, further arti articulating what actual, the actual malice standard means in terms of protecting the press in areas where language is not purely factual. Yet another way of you know, demonstrating um, the language, you know, these problems of language that jurists and all of us, journalists, everyone, historians have to face when we're attempting to represent the world, right? And so in, in these cases, the, the Supreme Court justices are increasingly, you know, they look at um, rhetorical hyperbole. Well, that's not really factual, but it's not really opinion either, but it's not factual enough to be susceptible to a truth falsity test. Epithets, ambiguous uses of language, all of these are protected speech, according to the US Supreme Court. But as time went on, in the last few cases, Milkovich and then Mason, you have the U.S. Supreme Court encountering language instances where the language at hand is very difficult to categorize. And, and essentially what they do is they take a, they, they wind up, um, in 
my argument at least, and I won't go into the arcade of it right now, but they wind up looking at different kinds of language uses and establishing them as factual in nature when my argument is that you know, these are, it's very difficult to make an argument that these are facts, that these are factual statements. Um, in the case of Mason, in the instance of Mason, how does one go about, the problem is this, the rule that the US Supreme Court articulated. Um, so actual malice, which is knowledge of falsity or reckless disregard for the truth, this is the false standard that a plaintiff has to prove to succeed, um, a public figure plaintiff like Mason um, would have to prove in order to be successful in this libel suit. He'd have to prove that Janet Malcolm published those um, quotations at issue with either reckless disregard for the truth or knowledge of falsity. That's a very high standard. It is hard to prove that a journalist or any or a speaker published defamatory speech with either knowledge of falsity, right? Because this gets to belief, this gets to interior, right? Um, knowledge of falsity or reckless disregard for the truth. In order to um, determine that in a case like Mason, the US Supreme Court said, is one has to be able to, um, one has to compare the meaning, meaning of the original statement, if it's recoverable, right? In this case, it's a, it's a contested matter of fact. He said, she said, you know, we can't even recover what was originally said because Mason says he didn't say it, Janet Malcolm said he did, and we don't have it on tape, right? She's got it in interview notes, but that doesn't count, right? Um, the meaning, we've got to compare the meaning of the original statement to the altered statement and then decide if there's a material difference in the meaning, right? I mean, it's a pretty tricky, it's a pretty tricky semantic and uh, philosophical your render or judgment that has to be made here. Um, and a lot of the way one would go about that is, of course, well, parsing, parsing meaning. Um, so to treat, I guess I don't have necessarily a problem with always treating quotation as a factual statement, but in certain circumstances, it becomes very problematic to treat an, alter, uh, an original statement, a quotation, as, as a factual statement. Um, and so this becomes part of this um, problem in the, in the line of cases in Sullivan to Mason. Essentially what happens is we get to a place where language, you know, it's, it's very difficult to make the argument that's purely factual. Um, and then the other issue, and the bigger one in my, in my book, is the First Amendment theory articulated Mason it doesn't even mention the notion of the need to protect um, public discourse, right? To protect the space where public discourse can take place. It doesn't even give a nod to the fact that people are going to make mistakes. There are going to be errors, unintentional errors made um, in journalism um, that need to be protected, even if they harm someone's um, reputation. What becomes um, the guiding First Amendment theory here is that the quality of public discourse must be protected. That is what the court said was its rationale for this particular um, understanding of the actual malice here in this rule of law. That is a significant distinction in my book. To protect the space where public discourse can take place, to value that, to um, make it so that discourse can happen, that's a very protect, I mean, that that's, it protects our free, you know, freedom of speech in a profound, and expression in a profound way. To protect, you want to protect the quality of public discourse is problematic because, of course, we begin to move into the area of, um, what is the content of public discourse, and it makes me queasy. Um, and so what I've done in the book is I've basically, I've made for the most part what is, I think, a, a fairly careful, um, analytic, and descriptive history. I've told the history of this case, right? But along the way, um, particularly in the conclusion, I do make some normative claims. And historians are not really, we're a bit uncomfortable making normative claims. The reason, of course, is that historians look to the past. For all of my talk about um, the postmodern critique of objectivity, as much sympathy as I have for that particular understanding of language, in the end, as a historian, I tell my stories of the past based on the material remains of the, fa of the past. I believe in the role of fact in the telling of history. Um, but I also believe that facts don't speak themselves, right? I also believe that the selection of fact is very important in the kinds of stories, the kind of truth we can I also believe that there can be multiple stories told about either an event in life in journalism or in history that are not exactly the same story because, of course, we live in a world, a diverse world, a pluralistic world, where there are different perspectives, right? And different people, different perspectives make sense of the facts differently, <coughs> right? And 
And so, with that understanding, and with a little bit of trepidation, in my conclusion, I make some normative claims. And normative claims, of course, I'm suggesting what ought to be, <laughs> instead of what is. And what I suggest ought to be is that um, in the realm of constitutional libel cases that involve ambiguous uses of language in which the ambiguity is pretty much indestructible, like we can't get over the ambiguity, we can't reduce it into um, clarity, then in those kinds of cases, um, the courts should protect freedom of expression over reputational interests. And I, I provide a little bit more detail about that in the, in the conclusion of the book. I also suggest that the ideal of participatory and deliberative democracy, that is the ideal undergirding this understanding of the First Amendment in New York Times v. Sullivan, and that is essentially the press theory that we use in this country to guide um, American journalism and have for quite some time, that this is worth working for, that that ideal is a good one because it is good for democracy that we, um, that we have this ideal of um, democracy and, and that First Amendment theory articulated in New York Times v. Sullivan, and we should not turn our back on it. Um, and then my final, my final normative claim is that this ideal, uh, an allegiance to these, to these notions, if one shares them, um, would mean that the American press needs to kind of move beyond this quick, quixotic, um, the quixotic search for objectivity, which, by the way, it seems to have done in, recent, in the recent past. Um, if you read the, the um, Columbia Journalism Review, there are lots of practitioners out there who are singing the same tune I am. Um, that you know, a better ideal might be transparency. It might be um, the straightforward discussion in um, codes of ethics for the press and even among journalists and in articles themselves of how the um, information was collected, how it was put together, right? There needs to be more clear social covenants, social contracts between reader and author. Um, that is, you know, writers of both literary and traditional journalism need to come clean. They need to tell us what they're doing, um, oftentimes. If it's not clear to the reader what has been done to create that report, let's say in the traditional report, a reporter asks a provocative question of a politician, and all you get is the quotation given, and you don't get the social context in which that question was asked, you're missing, we're missing something vital about public discourse, and perhaps even the creation of public, um, in some cases, even of public policy. That you know, journalists and all of us be much more um, sophisticated about how we report the world and then read those reports and make sense of language is a good thing. So I suggest it's, it's good for news to embrace American journalism, to embrace multi perspectives in the telling of the news and also a lot of a variety, a wide variety of news forms <laughs> itself. Um, and we see that happen. <laughs> we see that happening all around us. I'm kind of, kind of like beating that drum and it's. You know, the world has changed from the time I wrote, the, wrote those words, and um, well, not entirely, but it's, it's moved much more quickly in that direction. Um, I thought that I might read as a, do, how much time do we have left? I've kind of rattled, rattled on here. Pardon? I'm good. I thought I'd read just this one little section, um, just to give you, it's, it's just a funny moment in the book, it seems to me. Part of the work I, and here I'm kind of moving away from the arguments I make in the book and just telling you a little bit about um, the work I did to, to come up with the, the story I detail, the history I detail in this book. Um, part of the research took me to the New York Public Library on many occasions. And what I did there is I was working in the New Yorker magazine's institutional records. And I cannot tell you how many boxes of material and folders and how many linear feet of material are there. It's vast. Um, and it was incredibly pleasurable. I, this was the moment as a graduate student, I felt like a real scholar, like I had arrived, is going up to the third floor of the New York Public Library, going into that reading room in the back, ordering up these boxes, sitting in that chair, and spending days and days and days on three different research visits, going through the legal files of the New Yorker magazine and the editorial files. And essentially what I did in, um, with that particular research is I put together a chapter in this dissertation that's a history of libel claims at the New Yorker magazine from 1925 until the early 1970s. And essentially what the story I tell here is the magazine constantly employing um, legal counsel. They have, um, they have an out, uh, oh, the word's not coming to me, it's external legal counsel in the um, law firm of 
Greenbaum, Wolf, and Ernst. These are the people who um, defended the, they did the famous Ulysses censorship case in the United States, among others. They were probably the most significant literary um, lawyers defending freedom of the press, uh, freedom of book publishing and other kinds of um, press work in this country. Um, but it also shows the New Yorker fending off these libel claims over time and all of the strategies they developed, legal and editorial in nature, in order to protect their freedom of expression. It's a really interesting story. There's some really funny libel claims. And um, instead of reading one of about one of the funny libel claims, we'll do a little bit of that here. I thought what I would do is read to you this passage um, in which, I guess there's a little bit of that, in which you, you get you learn a little bit about these editorial and legal strategies the magazine um, devises in order to deal with these libel um, claims, the threat of libel law. At this time, of course, libel law had not been constitutionalized, so the press was even more exposed to libel claims. Um, so here we go. I just finished, um, before this passage begins, I've just finished talking about a particular um, unhappy, very early episode with libel law that involves the New Yorker, they won because they refused to publish a retraction and they just drew it out and they wound up winning. Um, and I think that's all you need to know. Thus began the New Yorker's practice of generally refusing to publish retractions. In the same year as the Defina episode, Greenbaum, Wolf, and Ernst, which is their legal firm, started representing the magazine. Among the first correspondence in the New Yorker records documenting this new relationship is a letter from Catherine White to Morris Ernst, the lawyer thanking him for a copy of a book he had just published. It, sh it, it should certainly be a textbook for all editors, she wrote. We are reading it avidly around here, and I'm grateful to you for giving me a copy. The book could only have been, hold your tongue, the book on libel Ernest Ernst wrote with Alexander Lindy, the man who would emerge as one of the leading literary lawyers in the country. The New Yorker had secured as its primary counsel a good man for the job. One year later, in 1933, on the advice of its lawyers, the magazine instituted a new libel protection process for profile authors and their editors to follow. Authors were to provide editors with a memorandum giving the sources of their information and the relevant dates. The purpose was twofold. On the one hand, such substantiation was a means of quality control, of holding writers to certain professional standards. On the other, it provided editors and lawyers with at least some protection in the face of potential libel suits. By this time, the magazine, under editor Harold Ross, had already established its fabled fact-checking department. In 1927, checkers were verifying all facts and pieces scheduled for publication. Within one decade, Vinyagoda has written, the department had become an institution famous for its Canadian Mountie-like determination to hunt down any fact, no matter how obscure, in both fact and fiction pieces. They even do this today in poetry. Fact-check it. Cartoons. Cartoons, thank you, Mark. This rigorous fact-checking was merely one part of a much larger editorial apparatus that strove for accuracy as well as flawless prose. An editor went over every fact piece accepted for publication line by line with its author. Copy editors, fact-checkers, and assigning editors then reviewed and marked page proofs. All edits and queries were transferred to a master proof, which the assigning editor used to complete the editing usually consulting with the author every step of the way. Though stemming largely from Harold Ross's devotion to journalistic accuracy and lucid prose, this editorial process appears to have served the magazine well in preventing possible libel claims. While New Yorker editors actively screened manuscripts for possible libel, they were also doing their best to keep the magazine's tone edgy and its substance hard hitting. In a 1936 letter to Lindy, asking him to review a three-part profile, one of the magazine's editors, John O. Whedon, wrote, we don't doubt that it's full of libel, but would like to publish as much of it as you think we can get away with. On the points that you consider dangerous, we would be grateful for suggestions as to how we might cover ourselves without pulling our punches all together, if you have any. In a witty postscript, Whedon added, if you happen to know of any libel concerning Hines, who was the subject of the profile, <coughs> that we haven't got in here, and that you think would add to the story, we welcome that too. <laughs> Despite the swagger in Whedon's approach, he took the threat of libel seriously. The magazine even asked its lawyers to review a three-part profile on Hitler. Being uncertain as to whether it is possible to libel Hitler or not, Whedon wrote to Lindy, we'd like to have you look it over and give us your opinion on it. As might be expected, 
Lindy found nothing legally objectionable in the profile. And some New Yorker, if some New Yorker editors considered the lawyer's libel review valuable, others chafed under it, including St. Clair McCowley during his three-year stint from 1936 to 1939 as managing editor. One of the magazine's most celebrated writers, McElway joined the New Yorker staff in 1933 after leaving the Herald Tribune. He thus brought a newspaper reporter's sensibility to the magazine, including the deeply held conviction that the constraints of libel law conflicted with the journalist's prerogative to report the world as he saw it. In a 1937 letter to Whedon, McElway complained bitterly that the Greenbaum lawyers were too swift to excise potentially libelous material in the manuscripts they reviewed. And here, here's his letter. I wish somehow it could be gotten into the heads of those lawyers that we are running a magazine and not publishing legal briefs. In my experience in this office, they have continually objected to stories, and we have continually overruled their objections, not getting into any trouble at all. If it had been up to the lawyers, for instance, we should never have run the piece on so-and-so who then published, who then invited everybody to a cocktail party. It seems to me that the lawyers on the whole are taking the easy way out of this problem by always telling us that we cannot publish such and such a piece, where if they worked a little harder at it, they would be able to figure out how we could publish a piece and get away with it. We might even consider someday whether the firm is a good firm to have as libel lawyers. All newspapers have libel lawyers who are experienced in the publishing game, and on the whole, newspapers get away with a great deal more than we are allowed to get away with. That libel law was a problem in the publishing business was clearly the consensus at the New Yorker, although different editors approached the problem differently. Whedon, for example, was solicitous of the lawyer's advice, while McElroy was contemptuous. Um, as the ma magazine's early brushes with the law in particular cases showed, libel law was ripe for judicial misapplication and for abuse by possible fortune seekers. It was this threat to the magazine's right to publish what it wished that most concerned the editors. Both Whedon and McElroy showed little concern for a potential libel plaintiff's right to reputation and their desire to get away with more potentially defamatory reporting within the New Yorker's pages. That's just one little, one little moment. Of, um, those of you who know a little bit about the fact-checking department at the New Yorker magazine, you can imagine that um, when this case went to trial, Mason v. New Yorker, the fact-checking department was hauled into, into um, the legal proceedings of the case. And Nancy Franklin, who was the fact-checker assigned to this particular, the Mason article, um, testified, and she was um, a centerpiece of, of um, the defense, as well as you know, the prosecution um, trying hard um, to show that she had somehow been negligent. Um, that there had been knowledge of faulty or reckless disregard for the truth. Dr. Shaw? Can we turn to a few questions? That's neat. Before we go back to the, uh, those quotes, <coughs> these, uh, I think you really tell an interesting story here, no doubt about it. I haven't seen it in the context of this large philosophical issue, but I, I see what you mean. But I just had um, a quiz with one of my, you know, my news writing students, and uh, they had a choice of using quotes or using some unquoted material. Where we're, we're in, you know, it's a kind of he said. 
that she said, I mean, she, she says that he, that Mason said all of this, right? So in some ways, she's, you know, embracing the subjectivist notion of, of journalism at the same time that she's challenging it. She said all of these things he said, and he says he didn't say them. But the U.S. Supreme Court said there are plenty of genres in which a reader or viewer would not understand verbat um, quotation to be verbatim. And in those genres, a case like this, a claim like this would be very hard to be, to be successful. So for example, um, historical documentary, or docudrama, or any kind of writing that purports to recreate conversation from memory, right? So we can think of Atul Gawande and his reporting, right? His medical reporting for the New Yorker magazine, which he does do that. Um, those, that kind of creation of quotation, um, the U.S. Supreme Court said would be very difficult to, uh, a reader should not expect verbatim quotation. You, you know it, the parties involved to some extent. Do you suppose there are some actual notes somewhere that, that would substantiate the quote one? What happened? And I'm asking about the honesty. I am, I understand. Um, this is, you know, part of the problem in this whole case is this relationship that developed, right? I mean, there are legal issues in this case and then there are ethical I'm going to get to your question in just a moment, but I do want to say something real quickly about the ethical issues here. Is that, in some ways, you know, Mason felt he was duped by Janet Malcolm, that she wasn't straightforward with him about what it is she was going to be doing in this profile. He felt like he had opened up to her and he trusted her. Um, and he felt there was a, a relationship beyond, you know, just journalist, you know, subject, and and he felt betrayed. And it's really difficult to fault. I mean, it, this. You know, the ethics uh, in, in this case, I think, are fraught, fraught, and I'm not a defender of them. Um, what happened in this case ultimately is, so Janet Malcolm said that she, the tape recorder broke when, she, when he was saying these things, that she was taking notes by hand, and, it, and um, she could, couldn't find those handwritten notes. What she could produce um, for the court is for her tight um, production. But still, it was a he said, she said, you know, they didn't have them on tape. Later, after the case had, there were two federal jury trials in this case, right? So the, the case works its way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, you know, rule of law further articulated, established, works its way back down. In 1993, the first federal jury says that um, Malcolm it did indeed libel Mason, but they couldn't, agree, they couldn't agree on damages, right? So the jury deadlocked on damages, and some jury members wanted to award him a dollar, some a million dollars. So, you know, the, the question of harm, like, did this really defame him after everything else he said in the piece that was, he did actually say that some people would construe it defamatory, did really defame him. So, mistrial. Um, 1994, the second federal trial in the case. This time, Malcolm is the victor. Um, and um, as the case was, as then Mason um, appealed the case to the Ninth Circuit, um, in that intervening time period, Janet Malcolm's granddaughter, pulled off in her summer home, off the bookshelf, this little red notebook at eye level of a toddler, and what did Janet Malcolm find in the little red notebook but her handwritten notes um, of this. Now, Mason says those are fabric, you know, there was this exchange in the New York Times um, editorial page, letters to the editor about, you know, Anthony Lewis, Anthony Lewis, <laughs> right, so, you know, making a law, the author of making a law, fabled journalist, New York Times journalist, very much um, someone who embraces, you know, traditional journalism. He writes a defense of Janet Malcolm, right, in an, in an op-ed piece in the New York Times when that happens. Um, and, you know, then Jeffrey Mason writes in a letter to the editor saying, this, you know, this is a case of, you know, the dog ate my homework. You know, this is fabricated. <laughs> she, she pulled out a red notebook and wrote this stuff in there, right? So, ah, it's hard to say. I mean, I today cannot tell you. I cannot tell you what happened. I cannot tell you who is. He said, she said, I don't know. So Janet Malcolm never admitted fabricating any quotes. No. Because that's the feel. Maybe I still think Richard Jewell bombed it, which he did not. <laughs> right. But a lot of people still have that connection in their mind. That's but right. You said ja Janet Malcolm to me before you started talking. I said, oh, that's right. She's the one who made up the quotes and defended it. That's right. But that's not the that's case. That's not the case. Oh, well, then I but she does. But no, no, no. But here, earlier, that Rhonda, why do you have that impression? Is that she does admit to compressing quotations that happened at different points in, in the seven months of interviewing 
compressing them into one monologue that she has Jeffrey Mason deliver over lunch. Well, yes. At the same time, it's contested ethical territory, and it became a problem. You know, it, it, even though it wasn't the legal issue in the case, it complicated. It complicated the way in which people made people could make sense. Um, so she took different points in time, compressed them, um, and so she compressed quotations and compressed events. Um, Woody, and then over to Tom. Just to play devil's advocate for a second, it is do you see any difference between say changing quotations and simply leaving out information? Both of them really could have two different effects. One is that it doesn't change the overall assertion of fact that the story is putting forth, <coughs> or the other one is that it actually creates a different impression. I agree. And so, uh, so to a certain extent, how would you counter the argument, you know, what's the big deal, change of quotations is no different than what you choose to include and what you choose not to include of the overall, you know, interview. I'd say changing quotations can sometimes be a big deal, okay. especially when there's a factual assertion at stake um, in, in that quotation. Um, I'm worried about this rule of law that's erected here, not because I want to allow all quotations to be altered without you know, being susceptible to um, a libel claim, you know, to be libel proof somehow. What I'm worried about is the way in which um, this rule of law doesn't, it, there, in, in the Ullman v. Evans case, Ken Starr, of all people, folks, Ken Starr, he um, comes up with a test for libel, an opinion test uh, for this tech, and, and it has, his test is much, much better for dealing with um, making sense of these ambiguous language conditions than this one, right? It, it deals with contextual factors, it deals with, it's much clearer in terms of determining, in my mind, I mean, this is the, this is the test that I recommend in my conclusion as being much more sensible than this material, you know, this incredibly vague, wrapped in mystery, and enigmatic kind of test, which is, you know, the material difference in meaning between a spoken, <laughs> you know, what was spoken, and, you know, what winds up written on the page, that material. So we're getting into the arcana of my argument that no one wants to listen to. <laughs> it's, but sure, but you, you make a very good point, and I don't disagree with it at all. I mean, that, that's a claim, I think, I mean, a, a challenge that. Sure. So is Ken Starr So what did Ken Starr recommend? He recommends this, well, it's, I had to find it in the book to like remember all the details of this contextual um, test for determining um, when language is, um, like whether language is factual or opinion. It's essentially an opinion test to determine whether it's fact or opinion in Ullman v. Evans. And it's very protective of the press. And it deals with all, it deals, I mean, it deals very much with the complicated nature of language, and it's a very sophisticated kind of philosophy of language that the test winds up um, embracing, which has to do with the contextual um, nature of whatever the language is, how it was used, all the different ways it could be interpreted. Um, it's, it's just much more complicated. And mm -hmm. in the end, um, Ken Starr, who so many people, you know, free speech is not uh, ideological. In the end, you've got people on the far right and people on the far left too, and pe all people in between who wind up defending, um, you know, the liberties of expression in this country. And so, I've just always been entertained by Ken Star <laughs> by the fact that Ken Starr um, wrote that opinion. So I, I remember when I first read it, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I completely had this um, cognitive shift. <laughs> not thinking about who Ken Starr was, um, but I didn't answer your question fully because I can't remember all the details of the of the Omen test. It's, it's 170 here. <laughs> Does anybody really want it? But, um, it's not, but it's not the rule now. It's not being used now. Exactly. It is still being, it is. It is still being, I'm just say, suggesting that in cases with altered quotation, it's the better test to use ah. than the one that is currently being used, which is Mason. This is being used in other kinds of opinion, like cases. Libel law makes no sense. Does it? <laughs> but we love it. <laughs> does oh, it make a lot of sense? I just spent six classes <laughs> trying to convince the undergraduates it does. Don't say that. Kathy. But you also told them at the end of class that you would give them a, oh, a hypothetical where the the, the, the stat your answer stat. is right. <laughs> right. Yeah, that drives Way me to crazy. go, <laughs> Tom. Um, can you just go back to that uh, the last slide that you showed? Yeah. Um, so I just want to tell a quick anecdote. I don't know if I haven't told this to you, uh, but uh, in, in one of my medical journalism seminars, uh, we read a story in the New Yorker. It wasn't by Abdul Kalani. I won't say who it was. But 
but there were long passages of um, quotes. And um, one of the students said, how could this person possibly have gotten down all this information? Because the context of the story made it clear that the person couldn't have had a tape recorder there at the time. So I said, well, why don't you write to the author and ask him how he did that? So he wrote back and he said, oh, these aren't really exact quotes. These were reconstructed after the fact, but I um, caught the reality of what was said. Were there quotation marks? Yes, they were. Wow. Yes, they were. And this, well, was, and this, and this happened <laughs> years after. Two different, literate, two different traditions, right? Yeah. Wow, this is in the, in the same New Yorker, in, uh, it, this was about five years ago. And um, so there's a lot of discussion in the class that, you know, this is uh, unethical. Uh, uh, there's no transparency. At least, at the very least, the author should have said at some point that these are not exact quotes. They are reconstructions, which would then lend a different uh, believability. Oh my God, I'm going to paraphrase. Yeah. But, Peter, but, but I saw it was unbelievable that the New Yorker that went through this whole Janet Malcolm case is doing it all over again without ever, um, you know, with many people not even being aware Peter, of it. Peter, what do you need to have it? Let me do say well, you, you you finish and then let me make a quick remark. That, that was just an answer. It's I a good a question. Okay. Um, according to that standard, um, actual malice, uh, knowledge of falsity or reckless disregard for the truth. If someone, or, or in this case, uh, Jan Malcolm, uh, in this case, or, or hypothetically, if someone had a, an actual tape recording. And then they, that person proceeded to do what Janet Malcolm did or what this other uh, writer for the New Yorker has done, or is still doing as far as I know. Uh, would that then constitute reckless disregard for the truth? Well, again, it depends on whether one is using this test or if one is using the contextual test represented in Ullman v. Evans. I mean, this, this is, test. well, a jury would have to decide, right? So a jury would decide whether the meaning of the original statement is materially altered. In this case, what is the original statement? That's an issue of fact. And so what the jury had to determine, ultimately in this case, applying this rule of law, right, was who was telling the truth? Was it Janet Malcolm? Was it um, Jeffrey Mason? For many of the quotations, there was one in which the um, tape record, there was a tape recording, and she had made an edit that the jury determined um, would inadvertently wound up defaming Mason. Um, this is the greatest, the greatest man, no, it was, had to do with his honor, the quotation that had to do with his honor. Um, and that one, it was easier to make a determination like this. Um, my position is still that this contextual test erected in Ullman v. Evans makes a lot more sense um, in, in comparing, so if you do have the actual interview tape and you, you have, so you have the original and then you have what's published, um, you still have, again, this problem of interpretation, right? Like what it means. And if there are a range of reasonable interpretations, right? Um, and if, so for example, there's not always consensus. When we talk about language use, it, it, it's very, in some language instances, there are so many different ways of reading what the language mean, can, means, right? What is being said. Um, that, if, I'm thinking of the Milkovich case, the Milkovich libel case, in which, you know, in this editorial, the um, writer said that so-and-so lied. Well, if you just look at that statement, so-and-so lied, well, that's a factual statement, right? So he either lied or he didn't. But was he using that statement, he lied, as rhetorical hyperbole? Was it, would he already established all the other facts on which he was stating the opinion that so-and-so lied? This is the Milkovich case, and these, like, these, these statements are not necessarily transparent, right? Exactly how one should read them like what the, what the meaning is, right? And so we're getting into territory where I quit, you know, things become cere you know, cerebral really quick and um, you know, abstract really quick. I wanted to make a real quick comment about the, this New Yorker practice and what one of the, um, one of the recommendations I make, um, and it's one that other literary journalists have made and have adopted, is that when they do something like Janet Malcolm did in this article or for example, when the doctor is recreating, um, I'm assuming it was a doctor who was writing the piece perhaps and was 
maybe not, but the piece you were writing about. I don't, I don't want to give details. Okay, okay, okay. But Everybody, let's let's assume. You're probably right. But let's assume <laughs> um, that if 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 if, if a um, conversation is recreated from memory, then it's really not the, the thing to do for a journalist of any kind is to note notes on methods. You know, it's it's either at the beginning of the article, or at the end of the article, um, or it's embedded somehow in the telling of the story. Again, you know, these should be things that literary journalists do and traditional journalists do. That is, if you are at, a, to get again back to this notion of asking the provocative question and then only giving the, you know, that there being a whole setting in which, you know, a press conference is taking place or in which the reporter is having a, you know, some kind of confrontation or some kind of moment with his, his or her source, that if you just give the quotation that so-and-so said this, you don't provide any of the contextual information, it can be very misleading. And that's been a way in which traditional reporting has worked a long time, right? Well, that's a problem too, right? So there should be built into these kinds of reports, not always, but sometimes necessarily, a little bit more narrative that tells us what's going on so we can make sense of you know what it is the person said. Was this a hot-headed moment when so-and-so is just spewing, right, and is frustrated? And I mean, how do we take, how seriously, how much weight do we want to give to that statement, right? So um, I think I've kind of veered off so, course so, here. So you're suggesting, I mean, narrative I, journalism is, is really, once again, a very hot uh, genre. Right. So you're suggesting that in, in all forms of narrative journalism, if there's any kind of going on, that, that the methods used to tell that story should be uh, either the beginning or the end of the story. I think so. I think the quote marks are something to have all. And the quote marks are, well, yeah, I agree with you. Does I have a different... the quote marks off? Only if I had told people what I was doing straightforwardly. And if I were clear, I wasn't. Um, you know, if it was, a, if I were having some, if, if, the, if, if the language were this kind of language, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do what Janet Malcolm did if it were this kind of, um, if it were this, if the language was this hot, right? And if it were damaging to someone, I wouldn't do that. Um, but she says he said this stuff. Remember, she says he said it. But, but as you said, at the top of a, a, a narrative journalist piece, the uh, statements and quotes aren't actually quotes. <laughs> that's that's straightforwardly. Dis I mean, if, if one if one uses that as a way to get out of being honest, that's dis you know that's not ethical. That's not that sh that's not ethical. Of course, right? You can't use that as an out for what it is you're doing. But there are moments when recreating co conversation helps a story. Okay. It well, seems I, to me. I'm not clear about which, what the directive is that you're suggesting. If if you recreate a quote, but you know you're not getting it exactly, do you need to say that? In the, in, are you suggesting you say that in the preface to the article? In most cases, yes. Okay. And I'm not going to make a categorical <laughs> statement there, but I think in many cases, yes. I was going to say, you know, it's 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 very akin to uh, disclosing methods at the start of any kind of scholarly work. You you tell, you know, what your methodology was for right. gathering the information, for identifying appropriate, and you know, go from there. And the following data were fabricated mm -hmm. in my office. <laughs> <laughs> My data. I can <laughs> fixed up my data. I know we're about ready to finish, but um, Tom Wolf studied at UJ in the 70s or sometime there. And uh, here's a question I asked there. I remember people asking how you do that. And what I do is what I tell them. One thing you do is you get the quotes exactly right. You get all the you get all the facts out of fact like any traditional journalist, and you weave it together this way.
one argument I do make in the conclusion is that historians and journalism, journalists, need to, I mean, what, the way I see out of this, like the objectivist tradition and the postmodern, you know, objectivist critique is a middle way, right, a, in the pragmatist tradition. That is, that as historians and journalists, we create meaning as a community. Um, so when we look at language and we go about talking about facts and making meaning out of the facts and interpreting the world around us, um, we go about telling our stories based on kind of community practices. And we go about making sense of truth um, by consensus, right? That is, the particular disciplines have their own truth-telling standards and conventions, um, and that's true as well in different modes of journalism as well. Um, and so we have to be much more mindful, it seems to be. It's not that any of these areas are completely clear or uncontested. It shouldn't be further interrogated, and I'm certainly, you know, whatever I say in my book is not the last word. It's probably not my last opinion either. Uh, you know, I expect to get challenged, and this has been a good, <laughs> good moment of that along the way. But the, the way out of this as historians and journalists, people who are committed to telling stories that are truthful, even though we admit at the same time that that truth is not necessarily unitary, it's not necessarily stable, that there are different kinds of stories that can be told, ones that can test our notions, my notion, for example, that participatory and deliberative, deliberative democracy are important, um, and the press theory under, that our press theory is important, those are normative claims. Those kinds of claims can be interrogated. Those aren't factual claims, right? And they are, that kind of truth that I see out there in the world before me is contestable, and it's contingent, right? And so what we see, what we take truth to be is contingent, and it changes, and we have, you know, we change along with it. All you have to do is look at um, scientific revolutions, Thomas Kuhn's argument, and the, the way in which our understanding of science has changed over time, what we took to be bedrock truth, has been challenged and overturned, right? To understand that, you know, what we take to be self-evident <laughs> is not always so, right? And I'm simply asking, you know, I'm simply asking the courts to be much more, um, in terms of, in the interest of protecting free expression, to be much more sensitive to those kinds of issues. So, yeah, that's all I have. Yes. It's not a foolproof argument. I could be wrong about all kinds of things, but you know, it made it stronger. 